is a possibility that we may finish this lesson on the Holy Ghost uh, today. doesn't mean I'm finished with the subject by any means, but uh, this particular lesson, um, in fact, I'm already feeling that there's at least a couple more lessons I want to teach on this subject of the Holy Ghost before we move on to other things. Uh, perhaps even getting back to the book of Mark, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But um, there are, as I said, a couple more things that I want to cover with regard to the Holy Ghost once this particular lesson is completed. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse number 1. This has been our text. This is the third lesson in this particular installment uh, on the subject of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And as I have said in each of these uh, lessons, I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to just have it. I don't want to just receive it. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Amen. Let's put our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands, lift our voices one more time. Let's ask the Lord to talk to us today. Can we do that, everybody? Let's talk to the Lord. Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence that has been here already. Ask you, God, for the touch of your spirit again. I ask God that you would grant to me anointing, God, to take care of this flock. God, I want to feed the flock of God. Lord Jesus, I pray that they can receive from you today nourishment. God, from your word. I ask you, oh Lord God, that you would help us and hear us today. Meet with us, oh my God. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, please have your way in the remainder of this service. Touch hearts, change lives. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Let me do a brief review here this morning and um, try not to spend too much time on it so that we can move ahead and get finished. Um, We talked about what the Holy Ghost is and it is indeed what the very title implies. Uh, I said to you, I think it was in last week's lesson that even though the Greek word Uh, that's translated ghost, can rightfully be translated spirit, and is in some places even in our King James Bible, um, and is translated spirit in most of the modern English translations. I still like this term, Holy Ghost. I just think that it helps us to really understand what it is that we're receiving. And uh, we've talked about the fact that we we think of of a ghost. We think of that as the spirit of one who has departed. This is not just anyone. This is the Holy One who departed from this earth and sent back his spirit or his ghost to come and dwell within the heart of believers. We've talked about the fact that it's not the third person in the Trinity. It's not even a person. It's not the holy person. 
It's the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, the scripture also refers to it as the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ. Or Ephesians 4 and 4 tells us there is only one Spirit. And so in spite of what some churches teach, that you are saved and Christ lives in you, uh, but you still can receive the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you that if you've never received the Holy Ghost, you've never received the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God does not live inside of you if you've never received the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because there is only one God. We talked about the Old Testament promise, how that God had given a covenant, and uh, part of that covenant, uh, a covenant, you know, is a contract. It's an agreement. And God made an agreement with his people that he would be their God, and he would take care of them, and he would provide for them. But their part of the agreement was they had to live in accordance with his guidelines. He gave them those guidelines, uh, some of them on tables of stone. Some he gave to them through the words of his prophet. Uh, they were written down in the books uh, of the Old Testament. And, um, and there God explained what he wanted, how he expected them to live. And, and they struggled. They struggled to keep their end of the bargain. Uh, in fact, there were many times they didn't even try to do it. They just abandoned it and walked away and did things their own way. But, uh, but God always called them back. And, and it is interesting if you are reading your way through the Bible and staying up with the, the, the chart, uh, or even getting close. It's interesting to see as God began to speak through the Old Testament prophets, how many times he called them back to him. But every time he called them back, it was always that he expected them to start living right. It was never just, well, I've changed my mind. You can come on back, come as you are. I'll accept you. It doesn't matter how you live. God always expected them to live a different life than the rest of the world. And they understood that, and they knew that. And when they did come back to God, it was always predicated upon their repentance and their turning around and going back to the ways of God, living the way God wanted them to live. But God promised them in those same Old Testament prophets. He promised them, I'm going to give you a new covenant. We're going to, we're going to restart this thing. We're, we're, we're going to hit the reset button and, and we're going to, we're going to start this thing all over. Now, the, the, the rules still remain. The, the expectations are still in place. You cannot just live any old way and call me your God. In fact, I, I know, I know, and I do know, uh, at least previous lessons, there are those who have listened online uh, uh, who may not agree with some of the things that I'm saying, but I'm telling you that even Jesus made the statement that if I am your Lord and master, you should do the things I tell you to do. It's interesting how much of the church world wants to call him Lord without really understanding what a Lord is. But Jesus is my Lord. Really? Really? If he's your Lord, why aren't you living like your Lord wants you to live? How can we lie and cheat and steal, commit adultery and do all kinds of ungodliness and say, Jesus is my Lord? He is not your Lord. He may be your friend, but he's not your Lord. Because a Lord has control over you. A Lord orders your life. 
A Lord issues mandates and commands and expects you to live up to them. And if he is our Lord, we're going to have to live to please him. I, I tell you, I heard a, I heard a Baptist attorney really preach one of the most convicting messages on the Lordship of Jesus Christ that I have ever heard. And that's the truth. Because he started talking about when those original apostles called him Lord. They meant it. And he talked about the things that they did and the way they gave their lives for him, literally laying their lives on the line. When they called him Lord, they meant it. And yet he said, we call him Lord. And we continue to do things we know are displeasing to him. And I'm not talking about just weaknesses where we trip up and we make mistakes. I'm talking about we know it's wrong when we do it. And we just do it anyhow. And yet we say he's our Lord. I'm telling you, he's not your Lord. If you're not willing to do what he says do. Uh, someone wrote a song years ago and, and then I heard I heard someone come along and sing it later and they changed some of the lyrics and I thought it was interesting what they changed because the original lyric as it was written said if you're not Lord of everything then you're not Lord at all that's really a pretty strong statement, but it's a fact. He's not going to be a partial Lord. If you're not Lord of everything, then you're really not Lord at all. And then I heard someone come along and sing it later, and they said, if you're not Lord of everything, then you're not Lord of all. And I said, well, that's redundant. That doesn't even make sense. You just said the same thing twice. But to say you're not Lord at all, now that's saying something. Are you with me this morning? And so this new covenant was this. You're still going to have to live a life that pleases me. But the difference is I'm going to empower you to do it. It's not going to be rules that are written on tables of stone. But it's rules that are going to be written on your heart. And that's going to happen through the power of the Spirit. This is exactly what he said. We read it in the book of Ezekiel. He he said, I'm going to give you a new spirit. And that spirit's going to empower you to do what I want you to do. And so that is the new covenant. It's not just accepting Christ. It's not just believing on the Lord. But it is Being born again. Again, and I don't want to, I don't want to be redundant this morning, but listen to me. How can people say they've been born again when their supposed new life is exactly like their old life? They haven't been born again. There ought to be a change in the new life over what the old life was. Or you've not been born again. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit. So we, we talked about in, in uh, last week's lesson, maybe we started the week before, I don't remember now, but we talked about the reasons why someone ought to receive the Holy Ghost. I think this, I think we did start with this last week, but, um, why, why should you receive the Holy Ghost? And of course, I answered the question with a question, Why not? Why would you not want it? I've never been able to figure out why people say, well, I know it's available, but it's not for me. Says who? Who said it's not? That's not what the Bible says. The apostle Peter said, it's for you. 
It's for your children. It's for all them that are afar off. I think that includes you. In fact, I know that includes you. Then we went on to give you some specific reasons why you need the Holy Ghost. First of all, you got to have it to get saved. Romans 8 and 9, if you don't have his spirit, you are none of his. I don't care what kind of profession you've made. I don't care how much you believe in Christ. I don't care how many times you've accepted him. I'm telling you that if that spirit does not live inside of you, Romans 8 and 9 says you are none of his. You don't belong to him. That's not me judging you. That's what the Bible says. John 3 and 5, Jesus said, unless you're born of the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Romans 8 and 14 says you've got to be led by the Spirit in order to be a child of God. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 3 verse 24 and 1 John 4 verse 13 both tell us that having the Spirit is the evidence of God's abiding presence in our lives. If we don't have the Holy Ghost, God has not taken up residence in us. Now, we talked about some of the benefits that come along with receiving the Holy Ghost. We talked about that the Spirit is what's going to provide the power of resurrection. If this Spirit dwell in you, it's going to quicken your mortal body. Uh, we, we talked about the fact that receiving the Holy Ghost is the way not only that we get saved, it's the way we're going to stay saved. We address the whole idea of unconditional eternal security, which is not found in the Bible anywhere. It is heresy. It is false doctrine. The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. Praise God. Now, eternal security is a possibility. Believe it or not, it really is. But it's not unconditional. There are conditions. The Apostle Peter said, if you do these things, you shall never fall. If. We talked about that last week, didn't we? That that word if shows us there for every if, there is by necessity an if not. So if you do these things, you shall never fall. Therefore, if you don't do these things, if not, you will fall. Talked about all of that last week. Won't go into all that. Uh, in fact, the last thing I think that, uh, no, not the last thing. One of the last things we talked about as far as the benefits of the Spirit was that the Holy Ghost brings to our remembrance everything that Christ says to us. We talked about how that if you'll be reading that book, you don't have to memorize the Bible to be used of God. Just read it. Read it. Read it. And he promised that the Spirit would bring all things to your remembrance, whatever he said to you. So you read it. You get it in there. The Holy Ghost can prompt it to your mind. And then the last thing we talked about was that the Spirit makes intercession for us, helps our infirmities. We don't know what we ought to pray for. We don't know the things that are coming at us. In fact, I said last week that I really felt somebody was going to have a bad week. This, that, that coming week. I I, I said, I felt, you can go back and listen to the recording. It's there. Um, I felt like somebody was going to face some really difficult things in this, what is now this past week. And I, have found that that was true. Um, But I said, if you'll spend time praying in the Spirit, God will get you through it. And in fact, somebody's week may have been, uh, may would have been, perhaps would have been a lot worse had you not spent time praying in the Spirit. But there's something about taking that time to get lost in the Holy Ghost when you pray. The Bible says the Spirit makes intercession 
through us. So the Holy Ghost knows what tomorrow holds. And the Holy Ghost, if we can pray in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost can use our tongue and our voice to pray for things we don't even understand, but we're praying about what we're about to face. I'm telling you, this is one of the greatest benefits of the Holy Ghost that anybody could ever ask for. When God can start praying about your tomorrows, Through you. Because he knows tomorrow. And he knows what you're going to deal with. So you don't really know how you ought to be praying. But the Holy Ghost does. And so you let the Holy Ghost pray through you. All right. Now, let's let's move on. Uh, Some more of the, the reasons why we ought to receive the Holy Ghost. Some of the benefits that come. Let's move on. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. All right, so here's what he said. He said one of the things that's going to happen when you receive the Holy Ghost is I'm going to give you the power not to witness, but to be witnesses. I'm going to change you. I'm going to empower you and make something out of you. I'm going to give you the power to reach out to other people. Look, isn't that what the kingdom of God is really all about? Do you understand? It's not just about us being saved. I've said it so many times, if all God wanted to do was to keep us out of hell, then he should save us and kill us all at the same time. And then it's guaranteed. Go directly to heaven. Do not pass judgment, do not whatever. All right, just, I mean, it's just, if that's all he wanted, but he doesn't do that. He saves us. And leaves us here. Now why does he leave us here? Absolutely. It's not just so we can come to church. And shout about I know I'm saved. And I'm so glad about it. And that's a wonderful song. And we ought to be glad about it. But that's not the ultimate goal. We got a job to do. We got in fact this is not in the notes. But go over to Matthew chapter 28. And, and let me, and, and, um, oh, I'm telling you, it's, it's hard for me to bite my tongue right now. I, we're going to talk to you tonight a little bit at some point during the service about something. Brother Hilton and I spent some time yesterday, uh, talking, planning. I've got, I've got some big plans for the coming year that I want to get everybody on board with, and I'm just having a hard time not talking about it right now. But no, 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 I'm not going to. I'm, don't don't try to twist my arm. I'm not going to do it. Uh, I, I, we'll talk about it tonight. I'm going to let everybody wonder about it. I will tell you, I, to me, it's big. It's huge. And I am just so, so excited about it. I can't hardly contain it. And uh, so I'll let you go home and talk about it and try to come up with ideas and try to figure out what's going on. And just don't bribe him to tell you, all right? We'll talk about it tonight. We'll talk about it tonight. But but anyhow, let's go over to Matthew chapter 28. And um, we, we all know verse 19, you know, and, and let, let's start with verse 18. But I want to show you some things here in, in all of this that we overlook because we get so hung up. On, on part of verse 19 that talks about the name of the Father, name of the Son, the Holy, name of the Holy Ghost. And that's all we focus on, unfortunately, in this passage. It really is. And, and we've kind of, our, our hand has been forced. Uh, we, we've been kind of backed into a corner that that's what we have to address with this passage. But there's something deeper here. So let's, let's start reading Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Saying, all power is given said, I've to me. got all power in heaven and in earth. Heaven and in earth. All right, now, now, now watch this. 
Go ye no, therefore. Stop, 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 stop. The first word is what? Go. Go. Jesus said, I've got all power. Now, he told us in Acts 1 and 8, I'm going to give you power. Right? right. Now, he's got all power. He's sharing that power with us. But he's sharing it with us for a reason. Go ye therefore and do what? And teach and all nations. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't racehorse me now. Let's, let's, let's take it slow. Go and teach. Teach. Here's what I want you doing. I want you to get out there and start teaching. I want you to start telling people what they've got to do to be saved. You get out there and you share this message. I've got all power. And I'm with you always. He's going to say that before we're done. I've got all power. In fact, fact, what what does verse uh, 20 say? Teaching them to observe all things uh-huh, uh-huh. whatsoever I have commanded. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. And lo, I am and with you lo, always. I am with you always. Even unto the end Even of the, the world. So Amen. I'm telling you, in verse 18, he said, I've got all power. In verse 20, he said, I'm going to be with you. So the one who has all power is going to be right there with us every step of the way. We don't have anything to be afraid of. We don't have anything to worry about. We don't have anything to be nervous about because the one who has all power is with us. But he's with us to do a particular job. Please get this. I I hope I can convey this. Verse 18, I've got all power. Verse 20, I'm going to be with you. Sandwiched in between is his statement. You go and teach. Let's back up to verse 19 because we we didn't finish that. I I want you to go and I want you to teach all nations. Baptizing them. Now, if you teach them the way they need to be taught, then it's going to lead to something in particular. It's going to stir up a hunger in people and they're going to want to be baptized. True. Well... You're not teaching them right. They're not going to want to get baptized. They're not going to see the importance of it. They're not going to understand the necessity of it. But if you teach them right, then you're going to have to baptize them. And when you baptize them, baptize them in the name of the one who has all power. Right. The one who is the father. He is the son. He is the Holy Ghost. So he said, go and teach and baptize. And then what does he say? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and yeah, of the yeah, Son. Yeah, we got all that leaders. part. Then what does he say? Teaching them to observe. Teach. Now, look. He said, go and teach and baptize and teach. Uh-huh. Go, teach, baptize, teach. Now, look, once you get them baptized, that's not the end. That's not the end. But you get them baptized, you got to teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Here is the goal. The goal is spiritual reproduction. I'm telling you, listen to me. And, and, and it's, I realized again the other day, I've let another year go by. I didn't, I didn't teach the lesson about my vision and, and all of that. And I don't know, don't know how I've let that go by again, but I did. But, but, I really want, I want everybody to understand we as a church should have a goal. This is my vision. This is my goal is that we understand just getting people to pray through is not the end. The end of all of this is, before I get to the end, the process is this. I'm going to find somebody. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to baptize them, and then I'm going to teach them to do what Jesus commanded. What did he command? Go, teach, baptize, and teach. So here's what I got to do. I got to go and teach, baptize, and then teach them to go do what I just did. I'm telling you, the process is not complete. The goal is not reached until we are not only soul winners, we have trained a soul winner. 
Well, hallelujah. That's the goal. And that's what Jesus empowers us to do. You say, I can't do it. You are denying the power of the Holy Ghost. He said he would give you the power to do it. So if you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got the power. Hello, I'm looking at a lot of sleepy faces this morning, and I'm trying to teach you something that is crucial for the future of this church. Well, hallelujah. I'm telling you, we got to get a hold of this. We've got to get a hold of this. Just because you're saved does not mean you should come in here and just be content. I'm telling you, you got to see yourself. I've got to go. God saved me for a reason. God saved me for a purpose. And until I fulfill that purpose, I'm not ready to sit down and be content. And my purpose is this, to find somebody, to teach them, to make sure they get baptized, and then to teach them to go and do what I just did. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Apostle Paul looked at his son in the gospel and he said, I want you, the things that I've committed to you, Timothy, I want you to commit to faithful men who shall also teach them. So he said, I have found my Timothy. But Timothy, I want you to find a Timothy. And I want your Timothy to find a Timothy. Hallelujah. We got to keep this thing going. We got to keep this thing going. Do you understand that one of the first, one of the first commands that God gave to Adam was be fruitful and multiply. It's one of the first commands. Now his first command his first command, if we're, if everything's taken in order, his first command, uh, was, was don't, don't touch that tree. You gotta be separate. Some things you don't touch, some things you don't get involved in. But one of the first things that he taught Adam, that he told Adam was be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And I'm telling you that, that in a spiritual sense, that is still one of our first commandments. It's still one of the most important responsibilities that we have. We've got to be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth. Is that what he said? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I'm telling you, let's put it now in a kingdom perspective. This is why the Holy Ghost comes. You shall receive power. Not power to cast out devils, not power to shout and dance and hoop and holler, but power. You shall be witnesses unto me. This is why the Holy Ghost comes. Church, isn't it amazing? I've said this before. When somebody does come in to get the Holy Ghost, there's a whole lot of things I got to teach them. There's a lot of things I got to teach them. A lot of things they've got to learn anymore. It's not like it used to be. It's really not. This world, their minds have been so corrupted. Their, their value system is so corrupted that honestly, you, you've got to teach people anymore that, that, Living together is a sin if you're not married. I mean, there are honestly people out there who really don't know that. They've been raised in a world where it's just accepted. They've been raised in a world where homosexuality is just a quote-unquote alternate lifestyle. I don't think they even use that anymore because they don't want to be considered as alternate. We are, we are dealing with people who have been raised with a mindset that things that we accept as blatantly wrong, they don't have a clue. 
You know, the great revivals of the 30s and 40s, you had somebody come in and repent. They're repenting of cigarettes. They're repenting of alcohol. They're repenting of fornication. They're, because they know these things are sin. Today, people come in. They don't really know what is sin. You know, I mean, well, I, I haven't killed anybody, so I don't know what i got to repent of. They don't know. There's a lot of things i got to teach a new convert. But I'll tell you this. It's been amazing. Everybody that really gets the Holy Ghost, I mean, gets a good case of the Holy Ghost, I've never had to say to them, now go tell somebody what happened to you. Because the first thing, I mean, as soon as they're through talking in tongues, the first thing they want to do is tell somebody. Right? Why is that? Why is that? Don't you think it's because that's why the Holy Ghost is there in the first place? That's really the reason why God gives it to us. And that's why that spirit, as soon as it comes inside, there's a drive, there's a passion, there's a motivation. I got to tell somebody. Hallelujah. And so we have an obligation to be fruitful and multiply and replenish, not the earth, at least not with human beings. But we've got a job. We need to be having spiritual babies. Hello. We need to be having spiritual babies. There needs to be something happening. We ought to be motivated. We ought to understand God gave us the Holy Ghost for a reason. I'm glad somebody took me to church. I'm glad somebody told me about baptism. I'm glad somebody told me about the Holy Ghost. But I don't want to just be glad I've learned about it. Come on, we got to get the attitude that those four lepers had. They walked in their stuff in their pockets with everything they could find. I mean, they're grabbing coat hangers and and tying them up probably with ropes, and they're trying to find some way to bundle this clothes. And finally, one of them looked around and said, wait a minute, fellas. Now, all that's rigging revised version, but this is what the Bible actually says. We do not well. That's what they said. Look it up. We do not well. This is a day of good tidings. We have come into possession of everything that our city's been looking for. And here we are hoarding it and just keeping it to, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in what I'm talking to you about. We're just hoarding it. We're just enjoying it. Man, we're eating until our bellies are full. We're jumping around, high-fiving each other because, man, look at what we've got. And just down the road is an entire city that is starving to death. They're eating donkey's heads and dove's dung. We do not well, Brother Hilton. We do not well. I love the Spirit of God we felt here this morning. I love the way the Holy Ghost has been moving in our services. I'm thankful to God for it. But I'm going to tell you, my brothers and sisters, we do not well. If we're just sitting here enjoying it, and not getting out there telling somebody, we found what you're looking for. Ah, uh, help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. We've got to find somebody. We've got to take this to somebody. We've got to tell somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got to tell somebody. It, it's always amazed me. Jesus walked into the home of Jairus. He's got his 12-year-old daughter there dead. 
And Jesus, she's just asleep. And everybody laughed him to scorn. And he put all the doubters out. He called her back to life. And the family's rejoicing. And Jesus said, now don't tell anybody. And I've, I've often thought about that, Brother Nelson. I've thought, my 12-year-old daughter is dead. And now she's alive. And you don't want me to tell anybody? You know, I, I just, I just got a feeling that Jairus looked at Mrs. Jairus and, first of all, in absolute shock, and 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 disbelief, and they're they're saying, "What? What, what did he just say?" Did I hear what I think I heard? He doesn't want us to tell anybody after what we've just experienced. And he doesn't want us to tell anybody. Do you look now, Mark Mark doesn't tell it, but but in the other gospels you, you can find where the Bible says they spread it abroad. How how do you have something that exciting and not share it? How can you have something like that take place in your life and you just sit around and keep it to yourself? Well, I want to tell you what God has done for each of us is far greater than raising Jairus' daughter from the dead because he raised us when we were dead in sins and trespasses. This is greater than cleansing a leper because he cleansed us from sin. This is greater than opening blinded eyes because he's opened our blinded minds. Well, hallelujah. I'm telling you, he's done something great for us. And then he said, I've got all power and I'm going to be with you. Now, here's what I want you to do. Now, look, back then with Jairus and, and, and it's conjecture on my part. Personally, I believe the reason he said don't tell is because he knew what was going on. He knew the mindset. He knew it was just going to cause greater trouble for him for word to start spreading that he'd performed a miracle like this. But before he ascended, Everything's over now. It wasn't time when Jairus' daughter was raised. In fact, you're, you remember that was the very thing that really triggered um, the, the, the Pharisees bringing Jesus or, or, or reaching a point where they were ready to, to do whatever to put him to death. It was the raising of Lazarus from the dead because that was such a phenomenal miracle that many people were being converted as a result of it. You can read it in, in John chapter 11. Just start reading the events right after that. This was the thing that really upset them the most. And so when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, you know, tensions are already starting to build. And I I just feel like that he's saying, it's not time yet. It's not time. I know what they're going to do as a result of this, and it's not time. But once all that's behind, he then gives this command. I'm going to be with you always. I'm giving you the power. I've got all power, and I am with you. And now I want you to do something about what I've done in your life. Go and teach and baptize and teach. And what are you teaching them to do, you're teaching them to go and baptize, uh, go and teach and baptize and teach. What are they teaching? They're teaching someone to go and teach and baptize and teach. I'm telling you, God wants this thing going on and on and on. Come on, church. I, I, I'm saying to you, it's time for us to have our spiritual nursery in full operation. Yes, 
It's time for us to be out there telling everybody we can tell about this great and glorious experience. I just can't do it. I can't. The Holy Ghost can. And if you've got the Holy Ghost, let him do it. Let him do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So one of the reasons why you need the Holy Ghost is so you can fulfill the purpose to which God has called you. He's given you a job. Replenish his kingdom. Populate his church. Well, hallelujah. Another reason why we need the Holy Ghost, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. I'm going to get off that because that always makes folks a little nervous. But sometimes we need to be made nervous. Let's, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. This is what I'm telling you. One of the reasons why we need the Holy Ghost is because that's where we get liberty. That's what sets us free. Now, liberty for a lot of things. In fact, the very next verse we're getting ready to read in just a moment, but, but the very next verse is, is the biggest part of what this liberty comes to do. But I'm telling you that liberty is, is far and beyond just one thing. He gives us liberty over sin. He gives us liberty uh, from bondage. And I'm telling you, he gives us liberty to worship. That's one of the reasons we receive the Holy Ghost. He wants us to worship him. God still inhabits the praises of his people. God still wants us worshiping him. The father seeketh such. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible says? God is looking for worshipers. God's looking for worshipers. He's not looking for statues. He's looking for worshipers. He wants people to worship him. He wants people to praise him. And I'm telling you, this is the beautiful thing about the Holy Ghost is whatever God's wanting us to do, his spirit gives us the power to get it done. We've got no excuse, Brother Hilton. We, if, if God says, I want this, we can also find where he says, I'm going to help you do it. So there's no reason for us not to do what God expects us to do. And I've, I've, I do have to hurry a little bit here if I'm going to get done with all of this because uh, I've only covered about one page of notes so far. Still got a ways to go. Um, so another thing that the Spirit does for us, another reason why we need uh, the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives is the very next verse, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I, I, I taught an in-depth lesson on praying in the Spirit. It's been some some months back that I, I taught on it. In fact, I've taught it more than once here. But one of the things that I pointed out is when you really get to studying this, Paul's, again, talking about times of praying in the Spirit or being in the Spirit, getting lost in the Holy Ghost that from that glory, from that glory to the next glory. And this is, this is not a, this is not an, uh, an A, B type thing where you get the first glory when you receive the Holy Ghost. And then the last glory is when you're fully transformed into his image in heaven. But this is a process. It's a procedure that you go through and, and, and what you have to 
understand is each time that you get into the presence of God, he's making you a little bit more like him. There are subtle changes. There are slight changes that God is performing in your life every time you get into the spirit. If you're praying in the Holy Ghost or you're, you're, you're worshiping in the Holy Ghost, whatever you're doing when the Spirit of God is working on you from each moment of glory, He's changing you a little bit more from what you were to what you should be. Praise God. Praise God. And we can never fully, in fact, we can't even start to bear his image if his spirit is not residing within us. It requires the work of the Holy Ghost to change us into his image. Well, praise God. Amen. I've I've got to hurry. I've got to try to pick up the pace. Another reason why we need the Holy Ghost. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 23. Now the works of the flesh. The works of the, the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are which these? Are these? Adultery, adultery, fornication, fornication uncleanness, uncleanness, lasciviousness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, hatred variant, variant, emulations, emulations, wrath, strife, strife, seditions, seditions, heresies, envyings, envyings, murders, murders drunkenness, revelings, revelings, and such like. And such like. Of the which I tell you before, uh-huh. even as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Right, now, now stop right there. This is what Paul said. This is what happens without the help of the Holy Ghost. These are the works of the flesh. This is what your flesh produces. Whatever you do, In the flesh, this is what you're going to get. If it's done through the power of the flesh, this is going to be the result. But if you'll be filled with the Spirit, God can produce something altogether different. What happens? Let's go on, verse 22. But the fruit of the the Spirit Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, joy, peace, peace long suffering, long suffering, gentleness, gentleness goodness, goodness, faith, faith, faith meekness, temperance, meekness, temperance, against such, against there, is such no law. there is no law. Now I'm telling you, here's what you've got to understand. Number one, first of all, understand this. Galatians chapter five gives us a spiritual thermometer. Right. You want to take your temperature? Read these verses. If you go through these checklists and you have a greater resemblance to the works of the flesh than you do the fruit of the spirit, you got a problem. The goal ought to be that we're doing nothing except producing the fruit of the spirit. Now, I will point out to you I will point out to you that it's not the fruits, plural. Can you put verse 22 back up there for me? It's not fruits, plural. Verse 22 comes right before verse 23. All right, there it is. But the fruit of the Spirit... Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because it's not like love is a fruit and joy is a fruit and peace is a fruit because if that were the case, it would say, well, you know, I've got lots of love in my heart, but I don't have any long suffering. I've got joy, but gentleness, now that's another story. These are not individual fruits. These are the aspects of the fruit. Of the spirit. In other words, it's like if if we want to talk about an apple, we can talk about its color. We can talk about its texture. We can talk about its taste. Its size. Its shape. 
All these things describe one fruit. And that's what Paul's doing. This is what the Spirit bears in our life. And if there's some part of this that is not being born in our life, then the fruit is defective. There's something wrong. If, if the, if the color of that apple is not what it needs to be, now I know that, you know, they start out green and eventually turn red, but, 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 but I'm telling you, if, if it's producing black apples, you got a problem with that tree. There's something serious going on here because this apple ought to be a certain way. And, and this is what we understand from Galatians 5 is that this is the fruit that ought to be born in your life. When you look at the things that your life are producing, you ought to be able to see love and joy and peace and long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You ought to be able to find these things as descriptions of what is emanating from your life. Not in part, but in whole. That's what we ought to be striving for. And that's, listen, we can't have the fruit of the Spirit if we don't have the gift of the Spirit. In fact, let me, let me tell you something, church. I, I am a firm, firm believer. And we'll talk about this in a moment, if, if I have time, but I'm a firm believer that the evidence of the infilling is speaking in tongues. I'm a firm believer in that. And, and I am a firm believer that every time you get filled with the spirit, you ought to speak in tongues. I'm a firm believer in that. But I'm going to tell you this, tongues are not the evidence of the Spirit abiding in you. Did you hear that? Tongues are not the evidence of the Spirit abiding in you. They are the evidence of the Spirit infilling you. But the evidence of the abiding presence of the Spirit is the fruit. People can talk in tongues and turn right around and be as carnal as the day is long. The real evidence that the Spirit is remaining, and, and in fact, and I, and I don't have time to get into this, but it is interesting that when God told John the Baptist that I'm going to show you who Messiah is, when you see him, he is the one upon whom the Spirit descends and abides. You can read that. It's it's there. It's the one on whom the Spirit descends and abides. And I still believe that is a sign of being a real child of God, not just that the Spirit can descend upon you on occasion, but that the Spirit abides within you. We need to do more than just talk in tongues. We, and I, I, last week I closed out by saying, if you hadn't talked in tongues in a while, you need to. And I still believe that. I, I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying right now. We still got to talk in tongues frequently. But I'm just telling you, we got to also let that spirit work in our lives. And there's got to be more than just talking in tongues. There needs to be love and joy and peace and long suffering. Those things need to be evident in our lives. Well, praise God. Amen. We need that abiding presence of God. Amen. Let me try to move on. I, I, I don't have a lot of time. Um, very quickly, let me just touch on, let me touch on for the sake of those who may be listening, um, 
online or may listen later online, um, let me just address this this morning. How do you receive the Holy Ghost? How do you receive it? Well, there's a promise that's made. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. And let's read verses 37 through 39. Now Acts 2, 37 to 39. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what brethren, shall we do? What shall we do? Now, let, let, me just, let, me, let, me, let me just point out to you. The question was, what shall? Everyone say shall. What shall we do? This is the question. So now let's read the answer. And Peter said unto them, Peter said unto them repent, repent and be baptized, baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. sins. And ye shall and you, receive the gift of Wait a minute. And you shall. Now here is the answer. Do you see this? The question is what shall we do? The answer is you shall receive the Holy Ghost. That's the answer. All right, and then he goes on in verse 39 and says but that this promise, promise is to you, and to your children, to, your children, to, all, to all that are far off, even the Lord now, our God. let's back up to verse 38, because I really, I don't know that we really understand this. Because we, we have it in our mind that this whole verse is the answer to what shall we do. And in a, in a sense it is. But really, the basic answer, grammatically, what shall we do? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The rest of it is the precursor. It's the prerequisite. If you want to receive the Holy Ghost, this is how it has to happen. So he said, I'm telling you, the end goal is you need the Holy Ghost. But you're not going to get it until you do these things. Right. You've got to repent and you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. These are the things God expects you to do before we can really get to what you really need. Repentance and baptism take care of your past. But we don't want to just get rid of the past. We want to deal with today and tomorrow. And the way you're going to deal with today and tomorrow, receive the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that's going to get you through today. It's the Holy Ghost that's going to see you through tomorrow. It's the Holy Ghost that's going to empower you to live like God wants you to live. It's the Holy Ghost that's going to give you all the things that you really need. But in order for you to receive it, you got to deal with your record. We got to get some things cleaned up. It's kind of like somebody's got bad credit going in and applying for a loan. And that banker looks at him and says, look, there's some things on your credit here that needs to be cleaned up. We're not going to give you a loan until this is cleaned up. Right? Right? You got to get this straightened out first. Once you get this straightened out, then we'll deal with you. And this is the way it is. God says the answer, what you need, is the Holy Ghost. But we got to deal with some things here. you got to take care of some things that are already on your record before we move into what you need now. So let's get those dealt with. And the way you're going to deal with that is to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Not saying Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, I've taught entire lessons on that. You can go through the website, find that, or, or contact us, and we'll be glad to send you links where you can go back and listen. I spent several weeks dealing with baptism. Never in the Scripture was it ever done saying Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's not what Jesus meant by Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. He said to do it in the name, and Father's not a name, Son's not a name, Holy Ghost is not a name. you got to use the name. Now, 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 Peter said this is the way we're going to deal with the problem. You got to repent and you've got to be baptized in Jesus name. Now, once those are done, we've addressed your past. Now you're ready to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, we'll tell you this. Sometimes, sometimes God does give it to some folks. Could we say it this way? He gives it to them on credit. Let me show you what I mean. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. Acts 10, verses 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. 
as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift now, of the now Holy look, Ghost. Look, the Jews are absolutely shocked that the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost. How did they know they received the Holy Ghost? It wasn't because they said we've accepted Christ. It wasn't because they said we've believed on the Lord or we've made a profession of faith. How did they know they received the Holy Ghost? Read verse 46. For they heard them Because, speak. that word for, because... They heard them they speak, heard them speak with, with tongues. tongues. And That's how they knew they received the Holy Ghost, because they were speaking in tongues. They're speaking in tongues. And so when the Jews heard them speaking in tongues, they said, man, these people have gotten the Holy Ghost. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. Then answered Peter. Can any man forbid water? Is there any way we can forbid water? That these should not be that baptized. That these should not be baptized. Which have received the Holy Ghost, which have received well the Holy Ghost as well as we. And, and he, he commanded them. And he. And he. Say it in the microphone. I want them to hear it. And he. Commanded. Commanded them. Now look. He's given a command. Why is he giving a command? Because. He knows the promise is if you have repented and been baptized. Now, they've received it. They've obviously repented because Cornelius was a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He prayed to God always. Gave much alms. This man was living a repented lifestyle. He'd already repented. God gave him the Holy Ghost. But Peter said, wait a minute. There's something else you need to get taken care of here. Something else we still got to do. So he didn't suggest it. He didn't recommend it. And for those who say, well, baptizing someone just makes them a member of the church body. I want to ask you, where was the church Cornelius was about to join? Hello? What, what church was there that Cornelius is going to come be a member of at this point? He's a Gentile. You think he's going to be able to walk into one of these Jewish controlled churches and they're going to, oh, you've been baptized? Good, you're a member here. Didn't work that way. In fact, a lot of the church people didn't even want to accept Peter for having done what he did. Don't tell me that baptism simply made a person a member of a church. It made them a member of God's kingdom. That's what it does. Right. You got to be born of water and the spirit or you can't enter into the kingdom of God. And so, and so he commanded them. You've obviously repented and now you've received the Holy Ghost, but we missed a step. Let's make sure that's taken care of. We're not going to let you just get by. And ignore this one. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So, you have to repent. You have to repent. Repentance is not acceptance. Repentance is not belief. We dealt with repentance. We taught, I think, two weeks on the subject of repentance. You can find that recording as well. Um, we dealt with repentance. It is not just it's not even just saying, I'm sorry. It's much more than that. It is, it is feeling sorry and it is determining to turn from sin. That's what repentance really is. It is a change in heart and a change in direction. It will involve saying you're sorry, but, but that's not all there is to it. Now, let me tell you something else you got to do if you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. You got to repent. Let me tell you something else you got to do. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Right, now, 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 look, these verses get quoted a whole lot. They, they get, people use these verses for a lot of things. But I, I, want you to, I want you to see the context here. Jesus said, ask. And you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. 
And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Read. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, ask bread of any of you that's that a, father, a father, will he give him would, a stone? Would the father give him a rock instead of bread? Of course not. Read. Or if he ask a fish, or if your son comes to you and asks for a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Would you hand him a snake instead? No, of course not. Now read. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he? If offer he asks for an scorpion? egg, is he going to hand him a scorpion? No, of course not. If ye then be now evil, look, if you then, what is the topic here? I know we use this for all kinds of prayer. We use this for, and 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 I think it can be applied to that. But that's not really what Jesus is driving at. Verse thirteen, he tells us what it is that you should ask and you shall receive. That if you'll seek, you shall find. That if you'll knock, it shall be open. He's dealing with something very specific here. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly father, shall your heavenly the father Spirit give the Holy ask. Spirit to them that ask him? You know what he's talking about when he says ask and it's, and you shall receive? He's not just talking about any kind of prayer. He's specifically dealing with asking for the Holy Ghost. He's specifically dealing with seeking the Holy Ghost. He's specifically dealing with knocking on heaven's door, saying, open up, I need the Holy Ghost. And he said, if you'll ask, you shall receive. And if you'll seek, you shall find. And if you'll knock, it shall for everyone. So don't take this out of context. Everyone, everyone yeah. that asks receives. If you're genuinely asking God for the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, God will give it to you. If you are genuinely seeking the Holy Ghost, God will give it to you. Well, praise God. You know, this has nothing to do with it, but I just find it interesting. These kinds of little things just intrigue me. And you may have seen it, known it, recognized it. But but Jesus told us to do three things. What were they? Number one was, was what? No, no, no. Right here in this, in, when he's talking about receiving the Holy Ghost, three things that he says to do. He says, we start out the first, yeah, thank you. The first one was ask, Right? Ask and you shall receive. So the first one's ask. I'm going to say ask. All right. Then he says what? Seek. And then he says what? Knock. Ask. A. Seek. S. Knock. K. A. S. It all boils down to one thing. You have not because you ask not. You got to ask. You gotta ask. If you really want the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, God wants to give it to you more than you could ever want to receive it. God wants you to have it more than you could possibly want to have it. Right. He's just waiting on you to ask for it. Don't, don't say, Lord, if it's your will. No, it is His will. He said, if you'll ask, He'll do it. And then I've had people that are praying for the Holy Ghost say, I'm just afraid it's not really going to be the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. I'm afraid it's going to be the devil or it's going to be just me. I'm a... No, no, no. Jesus addressed all of this. He said, is there a father anywhere that if his son asked for bread, he'd hand him a rock? If you're down here sincerely asking God for the Holy Ghost, do you think God's going to let you get something different? It's not going to happen that way. He cares too much about you. And he desires too strongly for you to receive it. I'm telling you, everybody that asks receives. And everybody that seeks finds. Everybody that knocks, it's open to them. That's what he said. That's what he promised. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I really, this is one of the things that I want to come back and do. Maybe even next week, uh, I want to, I want to come back and just teach on the evidence of the Holy Ghost. I want to spend a whole week.
just on the evidence of the Holy Ghost. So I'm, I'm not really going to deal with that part of it. We're going to skip over. I had some scriptures in my notes here. Uh, we're going to skip over that, but let's just go to Acts chapter two, verse four. Let's, let's, um, let's, let's go to that. Acts two, verse four. And, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. So when they received the Holy Ghost, what did they do? They spoke in tongues. Now I will point this out. They spoke in tongues as the spirit gave them utterance, or that word means the ability to speak. So real speaking in tongues is not repeating what you heard somebody else say. Real speaking in tongues is not when somebody sets you down and says, now you, you repeat after me. You say this. Somebody teaching you to do it. Real speaking in tongues is not speaking a foreign language that you already know. Speaking in tongues is when you're saying words you don't know. But the Spirit's giving you the ability to speak those words. Now, can I throw this out there for you, church? I want to tell you, I want to caution us. It is possible for us to speak in tongues enough that we kind of learn the language that we've been speaking. It's getting real quiet. And we can get very comfortable repeating those same sounds and syllables. My old pastor used to teach us, he, he, he said, you know, he said, I just ask God ever so often to change my language. I want to make sure it's really you, Lord. I don't want to take a chance on me just learning this and repeating it. Now, I can't prove that by scripture. I can't tell you it's got to be done and, and uh, and I do know that God's not going to give you a stone if you're asking for bread. I I know all of that, but I do think it's I think it's a safe practice. If ever so often we would just come to God and say, God, I really would like for you to change my language. So I would just like to have the peace of knowing this really is you. Well, Hallelujah. When they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now, I've, I've taught you, you can't develop a doctrine without uh, at least two witnesses. So let me just very quickly throw in the second witness, Acts 19, verse 6. When Paul laid his hands on upon them, the Holy Ghost came, the Holy on, Ghost them. came on them. And, and they spake what did they with do? tongues. They spake prophes- with tongues. They spake with tongues. Now, there, now, I know they also prophesied, but you don't have two witnesses for that. You do have two witnesses for people speaking in tongues when they receive the Holy Ghost. We'll, we'll deal with this. I'm going to, like I said, Lord willing, next week I'm going to... Uh, if not next week, the next. I've got two different things that I'm feeling with regards to the Holy Ghost, and I'm not sure when we're going to deal with which. But but within the next few weeks, I'm going to come back and teach an entire lesson just on speaking in tongues, just on this evidence. And so we'll establish then, we'll deal with it then in its entirety, and we will set it up uh, through the Scriptures and prove to you the things that I say. Amen. But I just want you to understand that there are two witnesses here that I've given you beyond everything I'm going to give you in the subsequent lessons um, that show that the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. If you've never spoken in tongues, you've never received the Holy Ghost. You have not been filled with the Holy Ghost if you have not spoken in tongues. Now, let me let me close. Let me close with this that there is a real purpose for the Holy Ghost coming into our lives um, beyond just the benefits that we have provided for you today. And it's a threefold purpose. Let's go to the book of John now. John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. Let's, let's see what Jesus says. John 16, verses 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for I... For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come... When he has come... Now watch this. He will reprove the world of sin. Now now, now, now pay attention. When he has come, when, when he... We're talking about the Spirit of Truth. We're talking about the Comforter. We're talking about the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost comes, here's what he's going to do. He's going to reprove the world of sin... 
and of righteousness and of righteousness and of judgment and of judgment these are the things that the holy ghost does he reproves the world of sin or let me put it this way when the holy ghost comes he comes to convict you when you receive the real holy ghost you do things and and I have watched this with new converts. I've had them come to me and say, you know, all of a sudden, I'm not feeling good about what I've been doing. I'm not feeling good about this. I've I've actually had them come to me sometime and say, you know, I, I after I received the Holy Ghost, I went to put on certain garments, and boy, I just didn't feel right about it. Now, why? Where did this feeling come from? The Holy Ghost reproves sin. That's why it's called the Holy Ghost. It reproves, it convicts sin. Listen to what John said about it in, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after, that comes me, after is me is mightier than he's I. He's mightier than I. Whose shoes I am his, not worthy to bear. I'm not even worthy to bear. He shall baptize he's you with the Holy baptize Ghost. He's going to baptize you. Now watch this. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And with fire. With that Holy Ghost comes. What? What? Fire. 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 Now, why did he say that? Read. Whose fan is in his, his hand. fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly, and he purge, will his thoroughly purge his floor. And gather his wheat, gather his into, the wheat into the garner. And he will burn up, he the, chaff will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Look, let us never forget that fire is a cleansing agent. That's right. You know how they purify gold? It takes fire. It takes real heat. It takes extreme heat to melt away everything that's not gold. And the only way you can really purify it is with fire. And John, John said, I, I've come to baptize you unto repentance. You, you've asked God to forgive you of what you've done. But but you got to understand, we're human. And you need something in you that's telling you when you're doing wrong. It needs to burn up the things in you that are not right. It needs to consume the things about you that are impure. Well... Hallelujah. That's what the fire, we, we talk about, you know, it feels like fire shut up in my bones. Go back and read that verse again. That verse, now that verse was not dealing with the Holy Ghost. That verse was dealing with the Word of God. The prophet said, I've determined I was going to shut my mouth and I wasn't going to speak anymore in his name. He said, but his word was in my mouth just like a burning fire shut up in my bones. That, 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 that was something altogether different. The fire of the Holy Ghost is not fire to make you run the aisles, dance, and jump. The fire of the Holy Ghost is fire that purifies, that cleanses. Well, hallelujah. Do we really even understand when, we, when we're singing about the Holy Ghost and fire? Do we really understand what we're singing about? Because we're really singing about being purified, being cleansed. That's one of the purposes for the Holy Ghost in you is to convict you of sin. And Romans chapter 15, verse 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified being by the Holy sanctified Ghost. sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Sanctified or set apart by the Holy Ghost. Now, Jesus said three things the Holy Ghost is going to do. It's going to reprove the world of sin. It's going to convict you when you're wrong. But he said also of righteousness. Here is what the Holy Ghost is going to do. It's going to teach you how to live right. Not just tell you what's wrong. But that Holy Ghost in you will stir you to pray. 
it will move you to fast. The Holy Ghost in you starts getting stirred up when it's church time. The Holy Ghost in you starts telling you you need to be reading your Bible. The Holy Ghost in you starts starts trying to, to encourage you to witness to others. It doesn't just reprove what's wrong. It teaches what's right. Hallelujah. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. And then the third thing he said, and of judgment. And believe it or not, the Spirit of God does indeed execute judgment. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, and I'm closing here. Let's stand. Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, my Lord spirit said, my shall spirit not always, will strive, not with always man. strive with man. For that he, is, that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. My spirit will not always strive. There, there are three basic definitions for this word strive. And all of them, I think, apply. It is to plead. It is to contend. And I found this interesting. I, I looked it up. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but just in looking it up, I just, I found this is the way that they listed the definitions for this word strive. To plead, to contend, and to judge. And I believe this is the process that God goes through. I believe that his spirit starts pleading with us. He starts out by pleading with us. He's, he's, he's trying to give us that gentle nudge. He's trying to put that little bit of conviction in our hearts. He's trying to, to, to lead us, to, to, to encourage us to do what's right. And, and if we just won't listen, then he starts striving with us. He, he starts, he starts wrestling with our spirit, trying, trying his best to get us back into the place of submission back under the control of his will and then if that doesn't work then he judges what we've done so I'm just telling you this we need to be sensitive to the pleading of the Holy Ghost hear me church please hear me anything that God deals with us about if we learn how to override it, no matter how small, it becomes common to us to override the Spirit. It really does. If we're not careful in the smallest things, we just get into this habit of, well, I feel the Holy Ghost is dealing with me about this, but we just push it aside. I'm telling you, we can, we can develop literally a habit of overriding the Spirit of God to the place that it moves God to start striving with us. And, and, and you understand when He, and this is another lesson for another day, but, but when He starts striving with us, He starts bringing things into our life to make us uncomfortable, to let us know we're in a struggle. You say, why am I, am I struggling? Why are things going this way? Why is, God is striving with you because there's something in your life he's trying to deal with. And if we won't listen to his pleading and we won't yield to his striving, he eventually will judge it. I don't want to reach that place. So I want to be sensitive to the pleadings of the Spirit. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm telling you, even in little things, even in little things, the Holy Ghost is moving and the Spirit of God you know, you feel that little nudge that says, you want to run the aisles. I don't want to push that aside. I don't want to push that aside. I don't ever want to be guilty of pushing aside the voice of God about anything. You say, well, how do I know if it's God or not? Well, I'm going to tell you this. You're not going to hurt yourself by running. You're sure not going to drive God away if you're feeling like the Holy Ghost is telling you. I'd rather do it and find out it wasn't God then not do it and find out it was. If it's not God, I may make a fool of myself. So what? I probably need to be humbled anyhow. But if it is God and I refuse, 
It's just one more step away from him being able to make in me what he wants me to be. Listen, church, we need the Holy Ghost and we need a fresh, fresh touch. We need to keep it fresh in our lives all the time. We need to learn to be sensitive. Let's gather around the front. My time is passed up. I didn't realize I've gone over time. Let's gather.